Hello, and welcome to Healing from the Ground Up, a series of conversations with interesting people. I'm Eric Greenleaf, and today we'll be talking with Bonnie Morse. Bonnie and her husband Gary are accomplished beekeepers and help people with classes, conferences, and other uh, advice and encouragement to sustain and expand the population of our most important pollinators. So, uh, Bonnie, welcome. Uh, Carl von Frisch, who uh, deciphered the uh, dancing language of the bees, mm -hmm. said in his Nobel Prize address, uh, let us now imagine a meadow in the spring. So I wanted to ask you to help us imagine that meadow, its important participants, and tell us a bit about the life of bees and their interaction with our world. Oh, with, their, with our world. Um, well, that's a big question, isn't it? It is a very big question. <laughs> that's very broad. How about we take it down to the bees and, and their world? Mm. So um, in spring, they're, they're waking up. The colony is growing. They've maybe spent, perhaps not here in Marin, when winter we maybe <laughs> <laughs> could call it. Um, but the, the population is growing after being diminished for the winter and being stuck inside in many areas. And they're out in the, in the meadows, as you, you say, um, looking for pollen and nectar and an opportunity to, to grow and expand and, if they're lucky, uh, reproduce and divide the colony um, and just get set up again for winter and may the whole process start again. And when they divide the colony, how did they divide? Where did they go? What did they do? Well, that's what most people know of as swarming. So swarming is a natural way for bees to reproduce. Um, it happens when colonies are um, uh, prosperous and there's lots of food coming in and the population is growing. Here in Marin, it usually starts around the end of, of March um, mm. and will continue through early June or so. Um, and when a colony fills its nest cavity, so if they're in a tree, it's a finite space. Mm -hmm. um, when they fill that nest cavity, um, they'll start making more queens. And when those queens are about to emerge or be born, I suppose you could say, um, half of the hive will leave with the old queen in search of a new home. And the rest of the hive will stay behind and hopefully the new queen um, who emerges will successfully go on and return from mating flights. And if both are successful, then now you have two colonies from one. So the colonies reproduce themselves, not just individual bees, but the entire exactly. population. Yeah, so the, I mean, a colony can die on a colony level, or it can reproduce and um, yeah, continue on. And some colonies this year in Marin, um, this, this spring we had later rains, we had better nectar flow, so there were colonies that maybe swarmed three or even four times. So it would seem as though there's a, there's a constant reproduction of healthy new colonies of bees. Absolutely, and for, I mean, if the population were to remain um, stagnant, um, then you would probably be losing 50% of the hives every year because that reprodu reproduction would be happening every spring. And you spoke about the intriguing matter of making queens. How does that come about? Um, well, queens, First, I should say, so there are three classes of bees, mm -hmm. or casts of bees in a colony. One is the queen that most people are familiar with. She is um, the most long-lived. She can live for up to five years, although these days they generally don't live quite that long. Mm -hmm. um, she is responsible for laying all the eggs in the colony. Mm. Um, she can lay up to 1,500 or even 2,000 when conditions are optimal. Um, the next are the workers. The workers are also all females. Um, which many people don't realize. Um, and then you have the drones, the males, and, and they comprise the smallest population in the colony. Mm. Um, and, and really, they don't do any work, they don't do any foraging, they don't build wax. Their sole purpose is to mate with queens from other colonies to pass on that genetic material, essentially. Huh. Um, so if a colony doesn't have enough food or isn't populous enough to, to take care of a large population of drones, um, then you might not have any in, in that hmm. colony. 
Um, so you were asking about how a colony makes queens or how that decision is made. So any fertilized egg can become either a worker bee or a queen. The drones, the males, are unfertilized eggs. So when the timing is right, when they either need to replace a queen because the older one is, um, is injured or dying, um, or whether they decide to make one because they're thinking about swarming, um, the only difference between the workers and the queens is what they feed them. Oh. So the queens are fed a diet of royal jelly, and that's all they get, um, which is a very protein-rich food that's excreted from the heads of nurse bees. <laughs> <laughs> And for the workers, the other females, they might get a little bit of, maybe kind of think of it as royal jelly light when they're very young larvae, um, but then they're quickly switched to a diet of bee bread, which is pollen and a, a mixture of honey, um, also protein rich, protein rich, but not as rich as the royal jelly. So queens, it's solely a matter of what they're fed. And we s spoke about the hives dividing new queens and new colonies. But what happens if the expanding population of bees runs into trouble, like they've paved the parking lot kind of thing, and uh, there's no meadow where the bees were, or the um, landscape is populated with animals and insects and um, pesticides? Yeah. What, what are the different threats to or difficulties for the development of this natural life of bee colony? Um, well, let's start with the biggest one these days, which mm -hmm. is actually what you talk about with the meadows, and we'll get there, is really important. But the biggest problem we're having with honeybees here in the United States um, are varroa mites. Mm. And it's a small parasitic mite, um, but visible to the naked eye, um, that um, evolved with the Asian honeybee. And they they've have, have some kind of um, balance between the two of them. Just the Asian honeybee has a slightly short, different development time than the European honeybee. Mm. They swarm more. And this little mite actually breeds with the pupa of honeybees. Um, when it made the, the jump from the Asian honeybee to the European honeybee, of course, uh, um, it, it was rather disastrous for the European honeybees. It can mm. breed exponentially more. Um, because it, it can actually breed in the worker brood, where, um, whereas in the Asian honeybee, it can only breed in the, the drone brood, the male bees, which have a slightly longer development time. So making that leap meant that the population could really explode. Um, and here in the Western countries, um, what we immediately started doing was throwing chemicals into the hives to try to control the, the mites. The mites. Oh. And now, kind of like with antibiotics, now what we've done is developed super mites that are resistant to most of the chemicals, and the chemicals that are being put into hives to control the mites, we're now finding are actually causing problems with the development of the bees themselves. Um, so that's a very serious problem because they that's can a very serious limit problem. or even destroy populations. Uh, absolutely. So in, mm. in, in some areas, like in Africa, this might, you know, with our spread of transportation and how quickly things can be moved around the world now, this might moved very quickly around the world. But in some areas, like in Africa, where people had neither the means or to pay for the chemicals nor access to the chemicals, mm -hmm. um, the bees took their losses and now are starting to build back with resistant stock and surviving on their own. We haven't really had the same situation here in the United States. What, what are some of the other sources of, or causes of, of colony collapse or difficulty for uh, either bees as pollinators or bees as reproducers? Um, so back to the meadows, food is really important on, on many levels. Yeah. Um, good nutrition um, involves um, a variety of, of sources of food. So apples might be healthy for us, but if that's all we ate, we'd probably have problems pretty quickly. Mm. So when you look at the commercial stock of bees that are being moved from monoculture to monoculture for pollination, um, they're not getting the nutritional diversity um, to make them more resilient. And monoculture would be a, a single crop on a large expanse of land? Exactly, so think about almonds in the, in the Central Valley of California. Um, it, when you drive through the Central Valley, um, you know, you see a lot of almonds. Mm. Um, well, 
bees have to be brought in to pollinate those, honeybees. Um, and really, like to backtrack a little bit, when you think about just our current agricultural system and the ability to have monoculture where you have miles of, upon miles of one crop in an area, that is really was built on the fact that you can close up these colonies of thousands of pollinators and move them from location to location to pollinate. Huh. But what were in those areas before the honeybees came in, because they're not native to the United States, were native bees. And the United States actually has about 4,000 species of native bees. That many? Wow. That many, but most of them are solitary and most of them are ground nesting. So imagine how they can survive or actually they can't survive in these areas that are now miles upon miles of a single crop. They don't have the food resources for long enough during any given season to survive. Um, and then when you think about what we do to the soil, if we're um, tilling it, um, adding chemicals to the soil, then we're poisoning or destroying their homes too. So we've become rather dependent on our ability to take these European honeybees and move them from location to location. And about those honeybees themselves, did they become progressively more limited to a single crop for their ability to survive? Or? No, they're not limited to a crop. In fact, they, they do much better when they have a variety of uh, floral sources. Um, they, they can withstand stressors a little bit better when they have, hmm. just like we do when, we, when they have a, a more varied diet. So that's an important part of that, that whole landscape is um, having more food for them, more food and varied food. And when you think about it and think about not only what's happening in the landscapes with um, our food production and how it's moving to larger and larger tracts of, of land with a single food source produced on them, when you think about um, the production of corn for ethanol and how that's changed the landscape in many areas of the country, it's taking away a lot of um, lands that were once vital for our bee populations to kind of rebound after they did these rotations on crops. So we're developing, or agriculturists are, a, a limited kind of dedicated population of bees that doesn't have its usual natural life or, and isn't local to the meadows that used to exist. Correct, yeah, correct. And a great example going back to almonds. So yeah. the almond is the first crop that, um, that beekeep, commercial beekeepers in the U.S. pollinate during the year. It happens in February, which is very early for yeah. where some of these commercial beekeepers are coming from. They're waking their bees up and bringing them on semi-trucks to California, about 1.7 million, or the equivalent of three quarters of all of the commercial beehives in the United States come to California to pollinate almonds. Wow. So imagine, if you will, uh, and when you see them getting staged, there's no food <laughs> out there before the almonds are blooming. You know, they're having to be fed sugar syrup or robbing each other out. So all of these colonies coming from all over the United States and you know, under these stressful conditions before the bloom starts, mm. um, it's a cesspool to ex of exchanging pests and diseases between these colonies oh. that then scatter after almonds and go back around the country. So any new pests and diseases, like when the varroa mite first arrived in the United States in the late 80s, very quickly is transported everywhere. So when we think about bees, we ought to think about diverse populations in the same way that uh, monoculture could be a, a kind of narrowing dead end if there's a failure of a single crop exactly. or animal species or whatever. And, and the world, for worse probably, is getting more like that. Yeah, exactly. And many of our crops are actually better pollinated by some of the native pollinators. Blueberry is a great example of that up in Maine. So the native bees can do a much better job, but just for the sheer amount that they're trying to produce, they need to supplement that. And because of the habitat for the wild bees, they need to supplement it with European honeybees. And in. What is, what's the standing roughly of the bee population year on year? Is it increasing, decreasing, remaining stable? Is it known? It, it went for the native bees or for the, hun the European? Both. Both so the native bees we know are declining. They don't get nearly as much attention as the European honeybees do, but we're mm -hmm. driving many of those species to extinction um, just because of loss of, primarily loss of habitat. Um, and also with some of the western bumblebees, they're not really sure why. Um, 
why that's happening. Um, the European honeybees, the populations, even though they have huge losses every year in the United States, have been somewhat stable just because beekeepers have to make up for those losses, you know, dividing more colonies and doing what they can. But it's certainly, uh, when you look at the loss statistics, what, 44% last year from the Bee Informed Partnership Survey versus going back a century ago, and it was less than 10% expected per year. Mm. So they're certainly under a lot more stress. Boy, it, it sounds completely that way, Bonnie, and uh, very worrisome. But I, did you and, and your husband's interest in, in beekeeping and the plight of the bees start with some appreciation of the colony collapse problem or, or in another way? Um, well, interestingly enough, my, my husband and I don't read a lot of newspapers or watch TV that much, so we were totally ignorant of the colony collapse issues that were happening. Um, mm. It was more of an appreciation of just the bees in our backyard and actually observing our, our neighbor <laughs> with some beehives in his backyard. And over a couple of seasons, well, once we realized that he had beehives, our first reaction, even though I've worked with plants and animals in some capacity, and even insects in one capacity or another my entire life, my first reaction to seeing beehives in his yard was, this is a pretty busy urban area. Isn't that irresponsible? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but after a couple seasons of uh, seeing he and his daughter working hives together and observing the cycles of the colonies just from afar and observing the cycles of his bees in our yard, um, we decided to, to get a hive. And uh, one hive actually became two within a week. Um, it was fascinating. So our, our appreciation for them really was because of just uh, watching them. And then once we actually had a chance to interact with them, they're fascinating. They're amazing. So it grew what, from there. What, what has captured your attention in the uh, keeping of bees and in their lives as, as insects and so on? Oh, it's just the social community. I mean, they're, con um, they're considered a super organism. Um, you know, we're actually, in some ways, the individuals operating within a single colony are sometimes considered almost like a cell would be in an animal. Um, their communication, their ability to um, just interact and how, how work is done inside the colony. Um, and just r really, they've, it's created such a greater appreciation for all things in the environment for me. As I said, I've, I've been involved with plants and animals most of my life, but the bees made me connect with the environment in a way that I, I really hadn't. I became so much more sensitive to cycles of season and weather and, um, and, and just observing how small differences really could impact them on a colony level. And then uh, you started a, a, a company um, to promote the uh, cultivation of bees. So my husband and I were really involved, and still are, with the Marin County beekeepers. Um, and through a survey that we did, we, like everyone else, were losing bees, and I wanted to understand why. So I started a survey here locally, um, and what it showed was that um, local stock, early season swarms, splits from beekeepers mm -hmm. here from Marin had much higher survival rates than commercial stock being brought in in the form of packages or nucleus colonies. Um, and we found, we've since found other communities are finding the same, having the same findings. So with the Marin beekeepers, we, we tried on um, a voluntary level to put together a group to breed local bees to, to make them available because oh. with the interest of increasing interest of beekeeping people wanted bees but their only choice was to buy this commercial stock and bring it into the county which was defeating our goals of trying to have higher rates of survival and stronger bees um, there are so many logistics involved though in breeding bees and the timing of queen cells and just everything um, that ultimately, and possibly in a moment of insanity, when my <laughs> husband and I's business model was changing and not necessarily in a direction we wanted to go with it, um, we decided to breed bees. So that's, that's how that got started. And, and so you provide what kind of uh, 
be services or education? People? Well, the, the primary purpose of us starting our company was to be a source of local bees. So that's, that's one thing we do every year. We're selecting stock that's been untreated for varroa mites or mm -hmm. these other um, diseases and um, breeding queens off of those and then providing a, a local source of bees in the form of nucleus colonies, which are small five frame, four to five frame colonies that have a mated queen brood, bees of different ages and food. So a complete colony. Yeah, as opposed to packages which people commonly get, which are just literally three pounds of bees, possibly most likely unrelated, with oh. a very young queen stuck in them um, with no comb or anything. Um, and it's really stressful for them. Most of those bees are coming off of almond pollination, so that, I mean, just the, the way it's done as well as um, um, what they've been through in the Central Valley um, might not be the strongest stock to begin with for people. Um, so that's how it started and from there then um, I also do consulting so I work with local beekeepers to help them and teach classes um, and then as my husband Gary likes to say honey happens so <laughs> <laughs> when we're lucky um, we also produce some honey that we sell. It sounds like such a nice and useful enterprise and very alluring because of there's constant learning. It's it's constant learning, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some Every of it day. forced and others Most of it forced. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I understand also, as we were talking before, that uh, you're going to be part of a, a uh, conference soon. So if you'd like to tell us a bit about that. Um, so we we organized a conference here that's going to happen in Marin, um, Audacious Visions for the Future of Bees and Beekeeping, or Be Audacious for short. Mm. Um, and it's it's a bi it's an invitational only conference. We're bringing researchers and commercial beekeepers and farmers and community activists from around the world together. So far, um, nine countries and 22 states. Mm. Um, to sit down and have active dialogue with small groups and discuss ideas about um, how we can change the current paradigm. And, and those are ideas some of which we'll develop more in part two of our show, but um, what, what struck me when you were talking about the conference is that it will be a working conference, not just a bunch of presentations or God forbid, uh, uh, slides and so on. But yeah, no slides. Um, in fact, if we have one presentation at all, we may or may not have a keynote address. Uh -huh. um, otherwise, it's going to be in small groups, and any presentations will be short, just report backs from those groups to the main group before they go into their next sessions. So some of the um, items that are currently on the tentative agenda, though that's up for changing as the participants you know, provide input. Um, Issues about local stock, um, pollination, moving bees or not moving bees, um, ideas about um, yeah, foraging, how we, how we change what food is available to the bees or change it back maybe so it's a little more nutritional for them. So, so uh, planting uh, varieties of plants that are, are pollinated by and, and that feed the um, Native the bees native and honeybees, yeah, and provide them a longer foraging time. And also just talking about how we can engage mm. more with the general public and get them involved in this because they're so important. It's very, even if they don't have hives, they're an important part of the equation. And what are some of your ideas about that, about engaging, say, your neighbors and people in communities and so on? Um, we have a, a, a handout, and I've seen the other groups have this too. It's three simple ways to help bees, and I think that they truly are simple and, and make a, a huge impact in the pollinator population. Um, the first one is just to plant pollinator-friendly plants in your yard. And uh, it, you know, here in Marin, we are so lucky to have so many native plants that are drought tolerant, so yeah. you don't necessarily need a lot of water that support both honeybees and the native plant populations. So just being more conscious about the decisions you're making and what you're putting in your yard. There's a lot of pretty flowers, but some of those flowers don't provide food for any pollinators. They just can't access the pollen and nectar. Oh. So just going into a store and seeing blooming plants doesn't mean that you're providing food um, for bees. 
Um, the other thing is reducing chemical use in and around your home, mm. which obviously makes a big impact on the bees. And even some of the herbicides um, they're showing are being taken up in the roots and, and possibly are causing some problems with bees. Um, so just being more conscious and eliminating or at least reducing um, what you're using in and around your yard. Are, are there any ways to help stem the uh, spread of these mites that are so difficult for bee populations? You know, for the general public, there's not a lot that the general public can do. Um, beekeepers can are trying, and there's a, it's a lot of contentious issues related to that because um, the, clearly the mites are a problem, and if you have bees that haven't been selected for resistance, um, when they start crashing, usually this time of year, um, they can get robbed out by healthy colonies, maybe some that have resistance and they're spreading those pests Ooh. and diseases. Oh. Um, so, you know, working on that, some bee beekeepers say uh, you need to, it's, you're irresponsible unless you're treating for the mites <laughs> to keep those populations down so that they're not spreading to nearby colonies. Other beekeepers say you're being irresponsible if you're treating for the mites because you're not allowing nature to take its course and you're not allowing, you know, uh, bees that aren't resistant um, to, to die off and rebuild our population from stronger bees. So that's a tough one. <laughs> and in this county in particular, it's a pretty passionate debate between beekeepers. I would imagine, <laughs> and, and it's a natural experiment no one knows the outcome of. No, and, and you know, both sides are right, but the problem is that you're never going to get everyone to go along with the treatment approach, nor are you going to get everyone to go along with the treatment-free approach. So. And it's a natural experiment. So trying to find a way <laughs> to respect each other and find a way to work together to, you know, something that works for everyone is, is a challenge. <laughs> and what, what are some of the other uh, topics that you think will be um, engaged by the people at the conference? Oh, it could go anywhere. We could talk about queens and how they're selected. Uh, mm. you know, talk about these breeding issues. Um, someone has suggested the issue of restocking apiaries. So like, literally, you know, could we have areas where resistant stock, which some people have been breeding for, where you could make it widely available enough um, to saturate the area so the drone population, which is an important part of the equation for those queens that are mating, um, could we change the landscape of the bees, which right now, um, by and large, have gone through a pretty significant genetic bottleneck over the last century um, for what they were selected for, and just simply the number of queens that have been used for large commercial operations and how many they breed. I think, um, hopefully, I'm, hopefully I'm getting this pretty straight, yeah. uh, but I think a statistics I saw, for example, with some of the Northern California bee breeders was that um, 1.2 million queens were produced out of 640 queen mothers. If you think about that year after year after year, that's, that's not a lot of genetic diversity yeah, happening. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's right. It's the same mothers producing the same yeah. genetic offspring, I guess. So some of the research is showing, I mean, just as we see this in plants and everything, uh, you know, genetic diversity helps with a little resilience. And yeah. even at a colony level, because you're going to get bees inside the colony that maybe have a genetic predisposition to, um, to um, specialize in different things, which overall helps the colony fitness. So, yeah. I, I remember that um, I saw a picture of you happily in the middle of a swarm of bees without any special protective clothing. Uh, that wasn't just the camera trick, was it? No, no, and that's actually that's the third way that people can help bees. So yes. if they see a swarm of bees, they don't need to panic. They don't need to bring out the can of raid. Um, that is bees, as we discussed at the beginning of the segment. That's natural reproduction. Um, bees, when they're swarming, tend to be um, have no reason to be defensive. They've gorged themselves with food before they've left. Um, they're in a pretty vulnerable situation. They're just looking for a new home. And they don't have young to defend, nor do they have food stores to defend. Um, so usually with those swarms, you can literally, you know, especially the new ones that maybe haven't been out there a long time or had kids throwing rocks at them or are getting hungry, <laughs> you could literally stick your hand in the middle of that. They're, they're that. They tend to be that docile. So if people see a swarm, you can... Um, 
there really isn't a reason to panic or even close your doors and windows. They have no interest in coming in your house. <laughs> so they're really safe to interact with as long as you're slow and quiet. Exactly, slow and quiet and just respe respectful. Um, that picture you saw where they were actually landing on me and those bees, um, just to tell you how it works. So when you well, see them... before you oh. tell me how it works, I have to tell you that uh, we'll be having a second part of our discussion and I look forward to hearing more about your bees and bees in general in part two. So thank you so much. Thank and you. Tune in to our second portion. So, um, sorry about that. There was no countdown, so I didn't Oh, that's know okay. That's okay. So I hope I didn't take things off too far. <laughs> no, they just chopped it. Eric, would you do the last line again into the camera? Yeah. So. Huh? I look forward to hearing more about your bees and bees in general in part two of our show. Thank you for joining us at Healing from the Ground Up. I'm Eric Greenleaf, and remember plant bee friendly gardens, not lawns. Eric, no, I, I mean, look into the camera and close the show just like you would. Thank you, everybody. Close the show. And uh, I thought I just two. Don't look ill at the script, though. Oh. <laughs> Thank you for joining us at Healing from the Ground Up uh, with our guest, Bonnie Morse, and me, Eric Greenleaf. Uh, tune in again for part two of our discussion about the world of bees, and we look forward to seeing you then. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, Bonnie and Eric, we want to get reaction shots, so stay in your seats. Well, we're going to get Bonnie's first, and Bonnie, what I'd like you to do is just look at Eric and nod, um, be serious for a while, and look at, stay looking at him, and then be um, smile a little bit. So these are just reaction shots, okay? <laughs> but don't talk to him. <laughs> Now I'm wanting to laugh. Him a little bit and just nod a little. It was good. It's like uh, deaf lady okay, to Okay, well, are you, Eric? Now, would you do the same thing? No talking. No talking, just uh, look at Bonnie and nod. Smile, be serious, nod some more. Okay. All right, that's good. Thank you. Huh. Stay where you're seated because you're hooked up with the mics. <laughs>